Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Now, we're just going to wait for one minute. I think uh, people are still coming in. Please don't leave the room. This is the room for the plenary. This is the room for the plenary, so don't leave. I'm just going to start in one minute. And, yep. Okay, good evening and thank you for coming back. Um, it has been a long day for the Australian people and it's just morning time for our Europeans presenter. And I am still getting really excited. I need more coffee, but we're getting very, very excited and we have two days of really good program. So before we start, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional custodian of the Macquarie University land, the Watamadagao clan of the Darek nations, whose cultures and custom have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Good evening, everybody again. Um, it is my great honor to introduce Professor Yanis Androtopoulos. Yenis is professor in the Department of German and Media Linguistics at the University of Hamburg. His research explores relationship between language, media, and society, covering themes such as spelling and script in digital communication, multilingualism online, language ideologies in media discourse, and the role of media in social linguistic change. I have been reading a lot of his work um, his cutting edge work is not just work, and I have the great fortune of meeting him in person in Hamburg in 2018, because I was tasked to give him a book. If you don't know, Yanis's office is in a really fancy building outside the main Hamburg University campus. So naturally, trying to get there, I was lost. Okay. On my way to trying to find his, this really fancy building, I came across a street sign the Hong Kong Strasse just outside his building. And I was, say, I was saying to myself, I remember, that's it, this is the right place and this is where I need to be. And the street signs turned out to be a great starting conversation on his work and um, particularly on his digital linguistic landscape work. And I'm really thrilled to introduce his plenary talk today, polycentric participations and multilingual practices in digital diaspora, as he will be shifting our focus to digital practices and the roles in our understanding of multilingualism and the value of multilingual resources for transnational participations and community building in a digitally interconnected world. So without further ado, please, Yanis, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Alice, for the kind introduction and good evening, everyone in uh, Australia. And good morning to those of you who log in from Europe. I think there's a, a, um, a couple of you also here attending as well. I'm uh, delighted uh, to be here and to be given the opportunity to talk about uh, some of uh, my research and our research uh, here in Europe. And I do remember uh, your visit to Hamburg, uh, Alice and Phil, and I do hope uh, we'll be able to welcome you again soon, rather sooner than later. I'll start with, um, um, I suppose I'm good to hear, so uh, the connection is stable, <clears throat> and so I'll start with uh, slide sharing and with going through my talk. All right, okay, so uh, here's another bit of acknowledgement, albeit uh, a personal one. Um, uh, the uh, research I'll be talking about uh, has been conducted uh, um, at the University of Oslo in the frame of a research professorship I entertained there at the Center of Excellence on Multilingualism in Society across the lifespan, Multiling. And uh, I have uh, done nothing in this research alone, but um, in companion and in collaboration with Christine Bolt Alexander, who worked at Multiling as a postdoc researcher from 2017 to 2020. Uh, as you will see uh, below, uh, Christine carried out uh, the entire field work. She did the contacts to the community and the families that uh, whose practices we investigated 
and uh, she brought uh, uh, all, uh, also all the linguistic and the cultural competence that it takes to study uh, uh, the um, communication of uh, by Senegalese Norwegian people. So I, I wish to acknowledge this and also say that even though I give the plenary alone, this is not my work in isolation. Um, what I'll do uh, today in about, um, I guess, 50 minutes time, um, um, I will uh, take you through uh, a bit of the theoretical orientation we developed in that pro uh, in that um, in that uh, project um, where we really started out in a qualitative exploratory way to carve out and, and find out relationships between uh, linguistic repertoires and digital media in the ways transnational families use digital media to communicate with their uh, uh, relatives and close friends abroad. I'll give you a bit of theoretical orientation. Uh, I'll talk a bit about methods and data, and then I'll present uh, five main findings from that project. So because it's a, a keynote, uh, the scope is quite broad and uh, by which also I hope to cover a range of different interests in the audience. I know that uh, there are a lot of different topics uh, in this conference on multilingualism, community languages and participation. So hopefully, hope you, hopefully you'll find a bit uh, in my talk that will be of interest to you. And I'd like to start with a little vignette, uh, an ethnographic vignette, one of the field notes by Christine, um, as she was observing uh, um, uh, uh, mediated communication by uh, uh, one of the informants, uh, a young uh, girl, uh, this is the daughter in family three, whom Christine called Rama in, her, uh, uh, in, in, the, um, in the data that we have. So the vignette goes as follows. Uh, Rama, oops, Rama hangs up after a phone call with her grandmother in Senegal, who only accepts the Jola language, one of Senegal's, Senegal's regional languages, in their conversations. She notices that she has received a Snapchat video in Norwegian from her friends from school, and then a Facebook Messenger voice message in Wolof from her cousin in France comes in, just as she's reading the usual goodnight message from her mother, who lives in Senegal, in French and English. So what you have here is a, a sort of an emblematic example for this kaleidoscope of, uh, um, of uh, communication practices, uh, all mediated uh, uh, by means or with a smartphone, but involving different applications. These applications creating or offering the ground for different spaces of interaction with different people um, um, in which different languages are used to entertain and to mentor maintain different kinds of social relationships. Um, the mother, her cousin from France, her grandmother, the friends from school, you can easily man imagine that a communication between Rama and those people has different frequency patterns and different intervals. But what we focus here on is especially that kaleidoscope of language choices and media choices that somehow play together or work together in facilitating communication. So uh, um, the first part of my talk is about uh, the, the theoretical underpinnings that we sort of uh, developed in order to talk about these things. Uh, there are a few points about poly media, transnational families, digital diaspora, and multilingualism. And I'll talk you through that before we go on to discuss the data. So the starting point is really poly media. Uh, so basically the idea that we live in an age where we have a, a, a multiplicity of media choices, of meaningful media choices in order to facilitate both local, but especially transnational and translocal communication. Polymedia is a um, sort of a buzzword and it's a key concept in a media studies theory called polymedia theory, where the emphasis is not on media as technologies and not on media in the public sphere, but on media as facilitators of interpersonal private communication with a focus on migrant families. So as you see here in the quotes by Mirka Madiano, who developed uh, the, the theory together with Daniel Miller in London, polymedia 
shifts our attention to how people treat media as integrated environments of affordances. And the key word here is also integrated. So the idea is that we don't study media in isolation of each other, but as a sort of a, a repertoire of choices that people pick and choose from and people uh, tailor together with other choices, linguistic choices or stylistic choices. So Polymedia pays attention to the ways in which users exploit differences among media in order to suit their interactions and manage the relationships. So the attractive thing from a social linguistic perspective about this theory is that even though there is not much analytic attention to language and interaction, sequential patterns in interaction there, there is an understanding of media as being integral to interpersonal communication and uh, of media as a repertoire that affords and enables choices. So living in an age of polymedia does not mean just having many, many media media to choose from. It means that we all the time make motivated uh, uh, um, uh, in, in interactionally meaningful choices from a range um, of available options. And you can make sense of these choices if you start from, from a few heuristic questions, like how do we usually communicate with each other from a distance? How do we do that? What are the default choices we take um, at the level of media, but also at the level of languages? What does it mean to call instead of texting? How do we arrange seeing each other online? And what do we do when we see each other online, for example, via Zoom or Skype? And so a key point of departure from a sociolinguistic viewpoint is that in a polymedia ecology, all media exist in contrast to other media. And that's important if you consider how people used to, um, come to, to study language online in the past, which was very much um, in, uh, taken in considering each media in isolation. Like I go on a forum, I take my data, or I go on Twitter, I take my data and I do a linguistic analysis. But this is not how communication works in the the digital uh, um, era anymore. It works by having this array of media from which choices are, uh, are made all the time. So any media choice may gain interpersonal and affective meaning alongside what is actually communicated. So media choice itself becomes meaningful. Now, living in an age of polymedia is a reality for transnational families. I think that goes almost by itself. That doesn't mean that there is a lot of research about it, but it's a common experience for a lot of people around the world today. But it's also a reality that has been neglected very until very recently in social linguistics. It has been neglected in the social linguistics of digital communication because most of that research is based on public, public domain data, which is, of course, more easy to collect and to handle. There is a scarcity of research on private uh, data, uh, data from families, from uh, romantic relationships, from groups of friends. And it has been also neglected in research on family language policy and multilingualism in the family, which has been thriving in the last decades, but which has not considered uh, um, uh, media and transnational families. So the research that has considered media and transnational families um, is um, mainly situated or has been until very recently mainly situated outside social linguistics in uh, media studies, in media anthropology, in education, and in areas uh, uh, like that where there, there is no focus on linguistic aspects. Language and multilingualism is sometimes mentioned in passing, but the focus is elsewhere. That research, uh, uh, for example, the paper here cited by Nedelko and Viss, or the media sociological work by Heike Greske in Germany, such research shows very well that digital media affords transnational families a sense uh, of mediated co-presence, a sense of being together or creating moments of being together from a distance. And uh, in these moments of mediated co-presence, uh, family activities and family practices can be carried out, a sense of being together and communicating also at an emotional level, laughing with each other, and, 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 and things like that can be carried out. And this research gives uh, a lot of very interesting and also very moving evidence for a range of practices of mediated interaction within transnational families. And these interactions sometimes involve uh, migrated 
expected parents who do parenting with their children who live in another country with relatives, like with grandmothers. And so there are these very moving accounts uh, of how uh, uh, Skype communication is arranged, for example, by the grandmother for the migrated mother to read bednight uh, stories to her child, a little bit like we saw in the vignette at the beginning. So that's an important uh, starting point uh, to us. Another important starting point is uh, the discussion about diaspora and digital diaspora. The, the, um, the whole point uh, about diaspora and um, from, from uh, the very early ages and throughout the 19th and 20th century is that diaspora and relationships between migrant communities and their places of origin have always been mediated. But the, the means of mediation and the scale of mediation changes. And so we used to have letters, we used to have phone calls and people sending tapes with sermons from one country to another. Uh, Arjuna Padurai has been talking about these things very early on. And now we have a much uh, more dense web of mediation, both uh, at the level of cultural production and at the level of interpersonal communication. So the talk, um, again, in areas outside of linguistics is about uh, digital diasporas in the sense of distinct online networks that diasporic people use to do a lot of different things. And this is something that you will see in our findings in these papers. So uh, diasporic people use or draw on the affordances of media to recreate identities, share opportunities, spread their culture, influence homeland and hostland policy or create debate about common interest issues by means of electronic devices. This is by Sandra Ponsanesi in um, Cultural Studies. So and um, uh, so that brings us also back to the beginnings of the discussion about super diversity and the diversification of diversity. That digital literacy practices are really a backbone for transnational diasporic um, connectivity, and uh, at a much higher and denser scale that was the case in the past. And something that we also found out in our research is that what happens, um, it seems, in the tens now in the past decade is that migrant people do not congregate on a single forum or on a single site online to pursue diaspora engagement, so to engage about the country of origin uh, and things like that, but they create networks of different platforms, different applications, and they sort of traverse these networks uh, in pursuing information about politics in the homeland or about religion and things like that. And you'll see some glimpses uh, from, from these uh, traversings of different media as we move on below. So that brings us uh, to conclude uh, that, that first part to the question, so what does that all mean for multilingualism? Because after all, this is the starting point. This was a starting point for me as well in a lot of research on language on the internet. Like 20 years ago, I started looking at multilingualism in migrant communities. So. The first point I would like to point out, and I think that is uh, in in consent uh, uh, with uh, with the, the the conference as a whole, is but that I use multilingualism as a bracket term for very heterogeneous patterns. I don't mean by multilingualism something that is fixed with definite features, but it's a, a bracket term, and many different things happen within that area that we sort of uh, um, enclose as multilingualism, and these very many different things are also evident in the research we did in Oslo. So I think one important point is that digital connectivity, so all the things that uh, transnational people and families do with media in order to maintain connections is densely entangled and related to multilingual practices. And uh, so what we um, try to understand in that project is how linguistic choices work together, depend on, but also words together with choices at other levels levels of mediation. So in a sense, these uh, transnational families have to make choices at several levels all the time, at the level of what app do I choose? What platform do I choose to communicate with a particular person? In what language? And do I use speaking or writing? And these choices tend to, so that's also the theoretical idea, these choices that are made all the time um, across media and modalities of language and uh, linguistic choices, they sort of turn to 
pattern together. So we see repeated co-selections of using a particular media channel in a particular language to communicate with a particular person abroad, like doing a phone call to your granny in another place because the granny is not good with texting and chatting. So you use a particular language for the granny and you use the phone call in a particular interval. And so to the extent we have these repeated co-selections, repeated co-selections of different choices for mediation. We can talk about repertoires of mediation. This is an idea that both fuels and is supported by this uh, research. And when we talk about repertoires, it's important to remember that these we don't just talk about piles of selections, but we assume that there is a level of enregisterment. So there is a level of reflexive awareness uh, of people that to communicate with person A, I usually do that within one particular digital environment and one particular language. And we usually both do voice and text, or we only do voice, or we only do text. And it is this enregisterment that is the backdrop for questions that may come up in the sequential flow of digital communication so that people might say, why that now? So this famous interactional question, why does he choose that particular media now, whereas we've been communicating through another channel in the past? Okay, so repertoires of mediation that uh, entail uh, some level of enregisterment. And um, the point we make with this research is that it's really interesting to think along these lines when we think about multilingualism online. So uh, um, the array of different media and the different patterns between media and languages. Let me now move you uh, to uh, a brief overview over what we actually did um, in the research. And so, uh, and at this level, it's obviously that Christine's authority and uh, Christine's agency is paramount. So I basically uh, um, um, both uh, both um, escorted and in part supervised that part, but all the field work was by Christine Bolt Alexander, who entertained for a, a long time relationships in the Senegalese community in Oslo. Christine had done her PhD uh, in the tense uh, on texting in Senegal and multilingualism and texting in Senegal, and she had these connections. And out of these community connections, she, she managed to uh, uh, solicit the participation of four families, uh, 11 people all together for the research uh, we did. So these four families are different. They reside in different parts uh, of Norway. There are, they have different family patterns, but all of them is what you could call politically integrated. So they have their jobs in, uh, in Norway. They have been living for some times in Norway. The children are both migrated in an early age uh, together with the parents and socialized in Norway, or they were born in Norway altogether. And that is also to say that parents and children have different social linguistic profiles and repertoires because the parents all migrated from Senegal to Norway and some of the children and most of the children have been socialized in Norway from a very early age. So we have family one. And um, uh, I will use that terminology uh, until the end of the talk, family one, family two, father one, father two, so please get used to that. Family one, father and mother, three children born in Senegal and uh, the younger ones born in Norway. Family two, we have a father from Senegal, a mother from another ancestry, a different ancestry, and two children born in Norway. Those children were too young, we don't have any data from them. Family three, father born in Senegal, an adolescent daughter born in Senegal. Senegal and migrated to Norway in an early age. Her mother is still in Senegal. And so the two of them are in Norway. And family four, uh, another one parent family. So family three and four are one parent families. Uh, a mother born in Senegal, four children, two young adult daughters uh, in their early tw uh, 20s. So there are children only in the kinship uh, sense and two adolescent children uh, born in Norway. So uh, uh, part of what we did uh, in the, um, in the um, uh, work, so as you will see below, we had a, a lot of different data that collected by Christine uh, in 
including language portraits uh, and interviews and repeated sets of interviews. And part of the interviews was about the self-reported linguistic repertoires. And then you see, so you see these long lines of different languages. Remember that these are self-reported and also remember that it was not an aim of the project to do any sort of competence analysis. So we didn't test their different language skills. There are other ways we used to assess uh, different skills in different languages, including the digital data themselves that we collected. So what you see in these lines is basically the accumulation of Senegalese multilingualism, West African multilingualism that involves especially French uh, as the ex-Colombian language and Wolof as the main uh, vernacular language of urban Senegal and also uh, other regional languages like Jola and Fula, and also Arabic to the extent this population is a Muslim population. And most of our participants are of Muslim faith, and it sh this shows in the data as well. So we have this Senegalese multilingualism, and on top of that, uh, what piles up is the migratory multilingualism. There is Norwegian, and for the younger children, especially for the children, there is English um, as well. And uh, you see some of the some of the speakers uh, have used their own terminology. So slang here means uh, streetwise registers of uh, the Norwegian. So what we would call in Europe, the ethnolectal Norwegian. Okay, so this is the term proposed by the son, uh, son himself. Um, uh, the data collected by Christine started offline. So it's typical for this kind of research to start offline rather than online as we used to do back in the day in online uh, data analysis, starting online. No, here we start on, offline, contacting the families going. So Christine went to their places, did interviews, had them uh, draw language portraits, which I, am, um, I suppose many of you are familiar with the methodology of drawing language portraits and multilingualism research. And we tried to get them to draw media maps. So to draw out uh, lines representing connections, uh, media connections between themselves and other people and then to scribble on the lines the sort of the media they use and the language they use and um, and then we uh, Christine asked the participants to share with us digital data and they did so in many different ways we have one paper uh, signposted or mentioned below that we discussed that where, where we discussed that in detail some of them showed Christine their smartphone and Christine was allowed to take a photo of the smartphone content others forward as threads, long threads going over several months or even years of communication with one particular person. Um, most of them offered, had no issue with offering uh, Christine access to Facebook profiles. So this was, uh, again, an important part of information for certain language practices, not for all of them. So we concluded with a lot of different data and, uh, and Christine had follow-up interviews with participating families uh, in part to, uh, to ratify the analyses that we did. And uh, so, uh, what, uh, so what you see here is the sort of uh, seven participants that we used in that paper on digital polycentricity that the talk is mainly, not exclusively, but mainly based on. And you see this different kinds of data. And we think that the important difference between all this digital data is not the technology by itself. It's not the platform, whether it's Telegram or WhatsApp or Signal or things like that, but it's the participation framework. And some of the chats are dyadic, so we have a lot of data for one-to-one -one relationships, meaningful relationships uh, between, between husband and wife in another country, between brother and brother, uh, between siblings and, 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 and migrated kids and their parents back in Senegal, etc. Et we have group chats, and the group chats are more focused around community discourses and community issues, people from the same origin, religious people, schoolmates from the same town and things like that. And we have the Facebook profiles that represent a more public, a more public area of sharing and showing and displaying things. Okay, so that is, I think, we think the, info, the, the distinction that matters when we go about interpreting and analyzing the data. We use that data to do mediagrams, to do these uh, visual representations of language modality and channel choices uh, for interaction between one focus participant, the ego, as you would say, in social linguistic network analysis, with identified interpreters. So the whole uh, thing is a spin on sociograms, obviously, uh, inspired by sociograms. So we used both objective data and subjective data to do these graphs 
uh, like here you see this is father one and so you can read each of these connections as a sort of a communication pattern father one uses spoken jola uh, spoken wolof i'm sorry spoken wolof to uh, communicate with his mother in senegal both on, in the phone app and on on whatsapp calls he also uses uh, spoken uh, uh, wolof to communicate with one of his sisters in senegal via whatsapp for his brothers in Senegal. He also uses written French, so they text and they write SMS and they text on SMS and WhatsApp, but they also use spoken communication both on WhatsApp and Skype, etc, etc, etc. So each of these can be read and interpreted and contrasted with one another. Um, okay. So that's uh, one bit of important information so far. And these mediagrams were made in a first version. Uh, um, we made them, uh, we developed the, the concept and we made them. And then Christine took, took them back to people and showed these to participants and asked, are these okay? And people said, no, oh, one particular person is missing. Or no, with that person, I also use that app. And so the mediagrams were developed further after that. I'll uh, put uh, uh, links uh, into the chat uh, of this paper and another paper to your consideration if you're interested. Moving now to uh, selected findings. So I have five points and I, uh, so I, I was fond of that, you know, that, that headline things family members do with repertoires of mediation. Because I don't know if you, any one of you knew Michael Klein, Michael Klein, the famous Australian social linguist. So Michael Klein at some point had a paper uh, about things trilingual people do, things trilingual people do. And I thought that's such a nice title for a paper. And so I got inspired by that. Things family members do with repertoires of mediation. So number one, family members in our study build repertoires of mediation. So they use, as you see, the repertoires of mediation are the, the piling up of co-selections, co-selections of languages, language modalities and media for communication with particular people and types of people. As a rule, we have particular people named, people named kins, uh, kinship relationships and also friendships. Uh, sometimes we have uh, types of people like my, uh, my, my uh, relatives in that particular village. Okay, so they built up repertoires of mediation and they make motivated choices from within these repertoires to pursue their own goals, but also to meet needs or expectations by others. And there are a lot of of anecdotal uh, evidence that we can show for that. You see, it's a small study, then the amount of data is not big, the amount of families is not small. This is a small ethnographic, um, so we can corroborate certain things only by more or less anecdotal example. For example, we have this one example, we see this pattern across different mediagrams to communicate with all the relatives in Senegal, they do phone calls in either Wolof or original language. They don't write in French, they don't take uh, WhatsApp, they don't use Facebook Messenger. So there is a focus on particular selections that are repeated across migrant people, okay, for a particular type of social relationship. Or uh, for another example, uh, uh, there uh, also, as you see, Father One uses the Facebook Messenger for some family members uh, and some relatives and uh, WhatsApp for another relatives. And this is because the, these apps sort of crystallize and stabilize or fossilize in the course of time. So certain relationships are done, uh, conducted, uh, communication conducted through particular apps and others through others because that's the way it crystallized in the course of time. And we also have anecdotal stories of how these apps change. And so people used to communicate through via Fiber and now move to WhatsApp and they share their stories with us with Christine in the interviews. Or they do both voice and text with some interlocutors, they do only text or voice with others. Also, both because they want to accommodate others' preferences or in some cases because they want to avoid. Sometimes they want to avoid voice, they want to avoid phone calls and they only do texting. Selected findings number two, maintaining connections. Family members carry out mediated interaction to maintain and develop multiple transnational relationships that are important to them. And um, 
the visualization here shows one color per family and the locations of identified partners in our data. So uh, there is a bit of confluence or congregation and that most communication goes between Senegal, between Norway and Senegal. So you see all four families. And in other cases, there is a bit of concentration on Italy and on France, but that really depends on individual migration uh, trajectories, uh, right? So one of the families has relatives in uh, Canada uh, and, and, and also China. Uh, another one has only in Italy and France, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can map that anecdotically and we know what kind of family and close friendships connections that are that people named to us. Okay. So, and all of that is mediated by these choices within people's repertoires. Number three, and I think this is uh, where I have more examples and where it becomes maybe more interesting uh, from a more linguistic point of view. All family members draw on their multilingual repertoires within the affordances and constraints of digital technologies. That is to say, uh, what, what apps can you use for writing? What apps can you use for reading? What are the different combinations of language modalities? Like on Zoom, we have another com a different combination than on WhatsApp. Uh, both can involve writing and reading, but in different patterns. So all of them draw on their multilingual repertoires when they communicate online in partly creative and partly formulaic ways. And this with the, the formulaic bit will become more evident and clear when we move to the last select and finding number five, because it affects, it concerns the younger members of the population, the children whose uh, competence in both French and Wolof is not as high as the competence of their parents. Okay. So uh, that's a general finding. And all uh, informants do both text and voice and communication in French and Wolof. So the main thing, the main combination of languages in these multilingual practices is French and Wolof. And we know that they speak Wolof at home. These families speak Wolof at home. And they try to speak a bit of French at home, even though French loses out for the younger people, because French has really no valency in, uh, um, in Norway. and. Um, and um, so they, um, we, we didn't systematically uh, compare uh, spoken and written language in that, um, in that uh, study. So we know uh, that they use French and Wolof, especially Wolof at home, because they told us we haven't got records of Wolof. So we don't systematically compare online and offline. We more focus on the online part. So they all use uh, French and Wolof. And as you will see in different patterns and different combinations, and some of them also use features from regional languages uh, in their communication. As you will see below, Arabic and English come into the mix elsewhere, not uh, uh, in that family uh, uh, talk and family relationships, relatives talk. Okay, so uh, this is not homogenous. So when we say that they use French and Wolof, we don't say that they all do it in the same way, far from it, because they have different levels of skills and because they engage in different activities. We see a different, a wide range of alternation patterns. And we can think of this wide range of alternation patterns as a continuum from a something that is more typical code switching, if you want. So where people index boundaries between distinct languages. So where people make one another aware of stopping with one language here and starting with another language there. And the other end of the continuum is a more free flowing language, something that has been transcribed, uh, described in parts of the literature as more a translanguaging kind of thing, where boundaries um, between languages are not that clear anymore and are not observed by speakers themselves. I'll so show you um, uh, um, some examples, but the general finding and the general impression from this data, from this mediated data, is that it would be analytically wrong to say this is all translanguaging. Um, by contrast, what we see is that there are often clearly indexed, perceived from us, but also indexed within the interaction boundaries between languages in usage, in the way they use different languages. And we think that uh, one part of the explanation is that they, so this is, this is, of course, informal and unconstrained, but it's written. It's written, so it's mediated and influenced by literacy skills, by literacy ideologies, as well as by digital affordances. And this affects especially adult 
informants. The adult informants in our sample were educated in Senegal. They learned writing French, the literacy language in Senegal. And so there is a preference. There is a socialization related preference for French in writing rather than for Wolof. All of them write a little bit of Wolof, but there is a tendency to use French as the main language of writing. So Wolof comes into the mix more as an insertional uh, selection and rather than in free flowing alternation. And the another thing that we see, which is very interesting in how multilingualism and affordances play together, is that a lot of, of those family members make use of the affordance of speaking, doing voice messages. So we see this repeatedly of people doing voice messages in Wolof and writing French, voice messages in Wolof and writing French. And so this way, this enables them to maintain community bilingualism, but at the same time obey, in a sense, their language socialization, their literacy socialization, which is that they basically learned it easier for them and comes more naturally to write French. So here are some examples for that. That is the main, I think, analytical point, And there is more that could be said on these things. So this is from the schoolmates group chat by Mother 4. So they have this group chat. We have several pages of that. And they meet now and then. And you know how group chats work. That one of them writes and the others respond either directly. So here we have a bit of more or less direct responses. First message uh, in 9, 9, 9, 954 by Mother 4. And then followed by another message and by another message. So three people in a short period of time. And so they write funny things things and they socialize and they exchange news. And what happens here is that Mother Fog joins the chat and, and does a nice wish for the Mubarak is Bon Vendredi. Right? Could you could you uh, And so so religion is indexed, but also community and friendship. And another person called uh, uh, called Iman does a joke, a silly joke like uh, so. Uh, uh, Twenty seventeen, it's an especial essay, etc. And then Guita turns him down in Wolof by saying, "You really want to show off." So this uh, this playful denigration or the playful devaluation or the reprimand, right, comes in Wolof, which is very typical if you know a little bit about you know discourse functions of code switching one language is for uh, the main thing of the conversation the other language uh, is used to index that something is a bit unusual or maybe it's a bit playful so they use Wolof to um, to negate things to conclude things to reprimand others whereas most of the communication goes in French here's another example to the same effect. This is by Father One. Father One is also on Facebook, and he does this sort of nostalgia thing on Facebook, like that many immigrant people do, right? That you put photos of your hometown, and then you join Facebook groups of your hometown. And then he posts a photo of San Luis, okay, in Senegal. And then uh, people uh, do likes and hearts and things like that. And Father One writes in French, Merci, mes amis, San Luis, et dans, dans mon coeur. And Friend One, uh, okay, so this is this is French, uh, and friend one responds in Wolof. Friend one prefers writing Wolof, and he is uh, he also uses the Wolof word for San Luis, Ndar, Ndar, not San Luis, not a French word, uh, and uh, he knows that uh, Father One can read. Of course, he Father One is bilingual. He just prefers writing uh, uh, French. Okay, and what does Father One do? Father One begins in Wolof and then switches again, uh, and by saying, "I'm alone in Norway," because his friend and asked in Wolof, mate, where are you? And so Father One begins in Wolof, accommodates the other person, and then continues in French. And the next friend who commands writes also in French. OK, so you have this, this uh, back and forth, which is clearly also accommodation work. So it is bilingual, but there is at the same time a preference. OK, with some of the youngsters, we see more of the free flowing thing. This is not to say that all adults respect boundaries and index boundaries between languages, as is the case here, I think. There's a clear boundary that also has to do with the topic and the content between one language and the other. Uh, it's not to say that all adults uh, do uh, code switching the same way and the, the um, 
adolescence in another way. There is free flowing and more boundary respecting in both adults and adolescents. But one difference with the adolescents is that their level in both friends and Wolof is not that strong. So they draw more on formulaic language and they, they, they connect different bits of formulaic language. So this is the uh, first daughter by the fourth family, D41. We're gonna meet her again in some other examples. And she has this chat with one of her uncles in Senegal. And there are in the concluding section here. And so D41 does a sort of a combination, uh, which is more or less formulaic. It's not very complex, uh, syntactically or semantically. And it's a merci, mais. This is something that's also very, I mean, very easy to, uh, to learn and to use. And then you're better than me in Wolof. Okay. So traditionally, you would say this is something like code mixing in a more syntactic framework. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the uncle copies this. He copies this, he copies both the propositional content and the expressive speech act. Ah, thank you, I'm happy. And he copies the sequence of languages like merci and I'm happy, okay? So there is this mirror repetition of the language choices that we know from code switching research that indexes consent and harmony in a sense. Huh? Conversational harmony is indexed by the sort of repetition pattern. And D1 does a little bit of the same, repeats, and contana parce mangi wak, the wall of, I can't read it, and note that the coding here is by Christine. Uh, in that case. And then D1 uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, opens up closings. Uh, I'm going to bed, good night, in the same combination. And then she offers a ritual wish um, in Wolof, and then they terminate that in English for some reason. Okay, good night, corrected, good night, and bye, and bye, bye. So French and Wolof are closer to each other here, and there's no sense of a clear boundary. So what, what is repeated and what, what indexes consent and harmony is basically the repetition of both in these very short terms. And there is another example. I'm also looking at time in order to, uh, to stick to time, but I'll show you a bit of that example because it's a really nice one. And it shows, I think this, this kind of example is closer to the ideas around digital translanguaging where languages and media and affordance by media all work together in creating a nice um, um, amalgam, so to speak. This is another exchange by D41, so the same person, the same person who was doing uh, French and Wolof here, uh, communicates now over years with a Senegalese friend who studies in Germany. So this is a person her age, and they have a flirty, uh, a friendly relationship over the years, and they live in different countries, Norway and Germany. And so uh, this excerpt starts when, when he uh, posts a video clip with speeches by a Senegalese politician and asks uh, uh, D41 a question. And D41 responds to that. And uh, they do this little political chit chat. And uh, he responds uh, uh, with another question. Do you remember the first time I asked you if your mother knew? She responds with an expressive, this sort of expressive uh, exclamation. And he does a little bit of, uh, um, uh, he does a little bit of uh, English uh, wall of code switching. So the, the English is the base language here. And then uh, D for one sends a voice message in Wolof. Okay, and uh, we don't have, uh, uh, we have the transcription here. And what he does is he picks up the language and he starts to playfully tease her about her level of competence in uh, Wolof. So headache, uh, headache each time I hear you speaking Wolof and he illustrates the headache and she laughs and he does the blamage, huh? blamage, uh, the uh, being embarrassed sign. And she sort of fights back and says, at least I tried. So she offers a sort of an excuse for her level of competence. So you see here very nicely how uh, stances are exchanged by the emoji in this particular. So making fun, but also being accepting fun, but being a bit aggressive about it at the, at the same time. Uh, and, then, and then this goes on and, and on. And so they, they, so they, they interact and they interact uh, in this, um, uh, interspersing of voice messages and, uh, and chat messages. So we have another, okay. All right. So a fourth finding, um, uh, the one before the last, um, and I'll take this very quickly in order for us to arrive at the end. But besides informal family communication, which was the third finding, and I hope 
you saw a few examples about how heterogeneous this is, okay? Besides informal family communication, family members use digital resources to participate in different centers. So, and we, uh, areas of engagement defined by particular discourses and particular audiences. And so this is what we did in the, in the paper, in the recent paper with uh, Christine Alexander on digital police centricity and diasporic connectivity, where we basically took this idea, this theoretical concept of police centricity and sort of applied that and reworked that to fit to what people do with digital media. And I think that even though you see we have little data, I think that's an important insight, subjectively speaking, that there is not one single thing that these people do when they engage in transnational communication with digital media. They do a range of things and they participate in a range of discourses. And each of these discourses uh, sort of requires and foregrounds certain languages and downplays other languages or disfavors other languages. And this is the theoretical idea of these centers. Now, the center is the idea that originally the idea that you have neighborhoods in a migrant community and in these neighborhoods we have you have centers like uh, physical centers in the built environment like the mosque and the playground and the school and each of these centers sort of imposes particular norms and particular expectations and we sort of see that on the internet as well we see that due to the practices of people. So the centers are not just there on Facebook, but people create centers as they congregate to read certain things, to view certain things, to discuss centered things. So these centers, and my excuse is that I, I'll take this a bit uh, more quick to uh, come to the final point. So some of them watch the news and read the news about Senegal. And as they do so, French, gains comes into the foreground because the Senegalese public sphere is dominated by French and there is very little wall of in that. So that integrated wall of French bilingualism sort of fades away as people turn to reading the news and watching politics and it becomes more French. That's the idea with the center. So the political discourse or the public sphere is a center that promotes French, downplays Wolof, and this happens and people are exposed to that as they use the internet to keep in touch with Senegalese politics, okay? When they go to their friends to discuss politics, this is done bilingually again, but then they watch the politics and read the news, they are exposed to this dominance of French, okay? And so we have examples for that, and I'll skip that a little bit. So they, it's political discourse and political like memes and things like that, and even sports and things about sports, so they read the news in French and they write the sharing comment on Facebook in French as well. Another center that's even more kaleidoscopic is religion, is Islam. So, um, of course, these people go, the religions among them, they go to the mosque uh, uh, in, uh, in their places of residence, but they also use the internet to share stuff. They share uh, chain messages, they share videos, they watch videos, and we know this because we found these videos on their timelines on Facebook or in group chats. They, one of them goes to a particular group chat for a particular group brotherhood, Islamic brotherhood, and there they do linguistically other things than elsewhere. And so to the extent people orient to religion, to religious messages, other languages come to the foreground. Arabic is there. English is not there at all. French is there. French and Arabic are a combination that's important. Why? Because some of these messages, some of these mediated messages about Islam, they're not just made for Senegalese people, but circulate across Francophone Africa. So they're made to circulate and they're made in Arabic and French because everyone in Francophone Africa and Muslim Francophone Africa is fit more or less with Arabic and French. So we have these nice uh, chain messages where they do French and a prayer in Latinized Arabic. And then it concludes again, if you want to be a good uh, religious practitioner, do this and that. Uh, and, and so you have the Kaaba emoji at the same time. And uh, some of them watch these videos, these very nice videos with surahs. Uh, and there is a spoken chant in Arabic. And then you see all the Arabic uh, letters and script and imagery. And we realize that uh, our informants 
they don't read the Arabic script uh, though, either at all or not very well. So they watch, they watch the Arabic script. It's part of the religious experience, right? And so one of the fathers, he's member of that particular brotherhood and they have a chat for this brotherhood in Norway and they use a different wall of there. They write things differently. They use diacritics. And in this chat, there are links to YouTube channels. So they go to YouTube channels to watch these sermons in wall of and the banners on the YouTube channels, they are again in French. So you have this kaleidoscopic thing that uh, where Wolof and Arabic and French are integrated, but they also have different roles. And then this again changes as some of them share stuff, especially on Facebook, that has nothing to do. So that's more globally, global pop culture, global media culture. And all of a sudden, it's neither Norwegian, nor Wolof, nor Arabic, but it's all French and especially English. So one of them does this sort of environmental and yoga and esoteric stuff. He shares that kind of stuff. And uh, the oldest son in Family One, uh, he does, he's into social justice and he shares other kind of stuff. And Mother Four uh, shares these memes about uh, dignity and about uh, gender. And Daughter Four too, her daughter is into hip hop. So they have this, they have this center as well, which is more global. It's not migrant. It's part of the diaspora experience and other languages come with it. And because they're in Norway, Norwegian shines through. So Father One sends these messages on Facebook when his children have birthday. He doesn't use any Wolof here. He writes French and Norwegian. And there are other instances where they use, uh, where they use Norwegian as well. Okay, uh, so uh, what we see is that I hope that's the point. So they have these different orientations and with these orientations, different weights and relevancies of languages uh, uh, come along. Okay, final point. If you give me another five minutes, I'll conclude this, uh, Alice. Is that okay? So, we, uh, so this is the idea of the centers and these centers have an analogy with physical centers in the original sense of an urban migrant neighborhood. So they use media to reconstitute, reconstitute important centers of socialization on the internet alongside what, what they do. Uh, uh, in their hometown in Norway, but there are of course differences because on the online they can engage in these different centers at the same time, so you can have an app open with religious stuff and another with Senegalese football. That's perfectly possible. And there are new centers as well. So there's global semiotic flow with this also hip hop and social justice stuff. And so they access that at the same time and sequentially intertwined. And uh, it's all of course very multiliterate. So all these centers are constituted by reading and writing, not just by, uh, not just by writing and also by reading and watching and sharing and things like that. The final thing, and the one I will conclude with, is that all these practices also offer certain opportunities for heritage language practices. Not many and not very systematic, but we see, especially for the younger ones, how engaging in digital communication in the private domain and also in different centers can promote uh, writing Wolof and also being exposed to different registers of Wolof. So Wolof is what uh, functions here as a heritage language, and we are aware of all the discussions, of some discussions around heritage language, and we don't think of a heritage language as a fully fledged system, but as a resource. Huh? So this is more along the lines of uh, Anna Defina and Kanagaraja's uh, ideas about the heritage language as a resource that people tap into to participate in, uh, in a community, in community interactions. So, and this is very much what we find with the children in these families. So none of them is a perfect speaker of Wolof and none of them uses Wolof entirely and exclusively online, but they all get opportunities to use different types of Wolof. So here is an example, uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one uh, interview by the oldest. So this is the same person who does the social justice English memes on the internet, right? But he also does phone calls with his grandparents and Christine asked him and he says, uh, when I do that, it's Wolof only. Since they don't speak anything else, then it's the real Wolof. So in the view, in the mindset of this person, there is a real Wolof. This is a more provincial kind of Wolof without French, admixture, and there is the Wolof he speaks with his cousin, 
Okay, so there are two different types of Wolof, and he gets this differentiation through the different interactions he has online with different people. Okay, and uh, so, uh, and Christine asks, and he says the same, I don't always understand stuff, they speak quite old fashioned Wolof, Wolof has become a little bit more modern with a little French, but they use real words, the grandparents that I haven't heard that stuff, and when he communicates with his cousin, he does different things, there they use the voice app, uh, the voice messaging to speak Wolof, so S11 speaks a little bit of Wolof, and his cousin as well, and when they write, they write in English. So they speak Wolof, they write in English. And we have other examples. That's a lovely example, but I think I'll skip it for, uh, in order to come to the conclusion. So they, they sort of teach each other a little bit, and in so doing, they flow more or less across uh, different languages. Let me skip that. Uh, sorry to miss it. Okay, so that's the main point here. And I think that might be interesting for some in the audience, maybe that's so um, uh, the, the transnational digital communication offers some opportunities. It doesn't come with a full wall of, but it offers some opportunities to engage. So this is what I told you as a concluding overview of the, uh, um, the things family members do with repertoires of mediation. They make motivated choices to pursue their aims or to tailor other preferences or needs. They engage in a wide uh, net of mediated interactions that are meaningful to them. They draw on their multilingual repertoires in partly creative, partly formulaic ways, uh, ways making use of media affordances. They also use digital resources to participate in different centers, thereby being exposed to different hierarchies and, and, and dominances of languages. And for younger family members, there is an opportunity there for heritage langu language engagement and little bits of learning. Conclusions, one slide. Digital media, as you see, enable family members to participate in many different things uh, according to their own view of volition and the relevancies in their communities. So they use media for social relationships, uh, discourses of politics, religion, popular culture, in each case, mobilizing different resources from their multilingual uh, linguistic and media repertoires. So digital media, and I think that's an important difference to an older Fishmanian way of looking about it. Digital media is not a distinct domain of communication. I don't think that fits what we see. So to say, this is the media, this is the family, this is, this is the community, this is the mosque. This is not how it works. Media, digital media is implemented everywhere. It's more fractal. It's part of everything. It's part of everything. And this is exactly why we don't have any monolithic thing like the language they use in digital media. What they do in digital media is fragmented and fractally distributed depending on the discourses they engage in, right? So language and literacy online are not detached from other languages in the community, language practices in the community, but they pattern differently depending on whom they interact to and uh, what the center of engagement is. And finally, digital interaction and participation do offer opportunities to mobilize heritage language resources even though this is not equal to a full language learning. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much. This is a lot for everybody to take in and I'm still trying to get my head around all the different um, centers, basically, to think about that. Um, we have a couple questions um, from the um, audience. So, Aniko, um, would you like to unmute uh, yourself to ask the questions, or would you like me to go ahead and ask it? Oh, Aniko, please, come hello. On. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, well, uh, well, thank you very much, first of all. This was a wonderful presentation, and I really enjoyed uh, this very interesting study. I have done some research with Sudanese refugees in Australia, and I, I can see some similarities in terms of how the communication patterns and the social linguistic repertoires are shifting between the older and the younger generation. But of course, when we talk about this uh, African communities, at least in, in my research, the digital divide was also evident in some families where, you know, the access to the computer or multiple devices in the house, for example, was, was a limitation and that would certainly impact on their choices. So I think that the difficulty for me in this kind of research is that the choice is not always a free choice, right? So that's one, 
one point I would like to make. But also, I, I was wondering about <clears throat> methodologically in terms of the enregistrement you were talking about, in terms of calling these choices, uh, to what extent do you think you have a consistent pattern in these choices so that we can actually conceptualize them as enregistrement mm. as such? That's a, that's a very good question. And also your question in the chat is, uh, is very good and to the point, uh, whether digital media shift hierarchies of languages. So um, I think that to answer that question in the chat, you would need to look at offline language practices in much more detail than we did. That's a weakness of our study that the weight is uh, on what they do uh, um, online. But I do think that the repeated exposure and the repeated um, pract uh, pr productive use of certain languages plays its role in reconfiguring hierarchies of languages. And, and so um, I think it's um, evident that there's a lot more exposure to English uh, through the online practices for all of them, uh, and especially perhaps for the younger, than they have in the community where they have um, also Norwegian and Wolof um, in the family. The enregisterment thing is both, um, is in part a finding from, is in part evidence from some of the data so we see an awareness of selecting certain things for select uh, for certain types of relationships. So to say that with certain people in my village, I use that particular app and that particular language for those and those reasons. So that's a bottom line for enregisterment. There is a reflexive connection between a type of participation framework and a type of linguistic or semiotic choice. But at the same time, what I was saying about enregisterment is, of course, projective theory. This is the way I think about repertoires of mediation as including reflexive awareness of I usually choose these kinds of things for this kind of communication, because this awareness is the basis for inferences, for interpretative inferencing, right? So to say that if they choose this media now in opposition to the past, then this particular media choice has a meaning. It's urgent or it's frozen, it's stiff or something like that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we also have um, a question from Chloe. Hi, yes, thank you so much for a brilliant talk. I really enjoyed it as well. And I feel like your research is really bringing notions of speaker accommodation into the 2020s and into the present. And I think that's really great. Um, so I was just wondering whether you think that this heritage language use by different media assists speakers with heritage language maintenance, especially the younger generations. Well, I think it helps. I think it. I, I do think it helps. It helps them get this sense of different registers within the heritage language, and um, uh, and so. Uh, but of course, it's not the media that helps. I mean, this is a sort of a metonym that we use. What helps is that they maintain connections. They maintain contacts. And so media are the facilitators there, really. And uh, the facilitators and also with their with the affordances that they have, they facilitate even more. So for some of these uh, people, it's easier to write in Wolof because they don't want to, uh, to, to speak Wolof. They don't want to write it or they've never written it before. So they speak it a little bit and they write something different. It's an option. So they do it. But the main point is whether they do it or not. And we see that some of these family and relatives connections are actually really sparse and not all of them it's not that they communicate with a whole uh, uh, kinship once a week or something now some of them are a few times a year and you have broken connections and comment ça va or a line and then a line three weeks later so it's not as rosy and and uh, an idea ideal as it might have come across but there is a backdrop and a platform for them to engage. And we have this both at the level of objective late data, we see that they use Wolof, uh, and also at the level of subjective data. Some of them said in the interviews, I'm going to this particular group chat, and so this is where it helps me with my Wolof and things like that. And of course, they do YouTube comedy and things like that, and so they, they get exposed to, uh, uh, in more, to more mass-mediated Wolof as well. So yes, it helps, but it has to be done by the people themselves. Sure, yeah. thank you so much. Do we have any other questions that you would like to ask um, there? There is one by uh, Taylor, I think. Are you? I don't know if you were there. Yes. 
Um, I, yes, yes, please. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Oh, it was just a big thank you. And uh, just sharing that uh, as part of an Algerian family between Darija and French and also a bit of English now, just recognize so many correspondences and those different practices, discourse practices. And um, so interesting about how different channels lead to different languages and it becomes so crystallized. I just really appreciated that point. Um, and uh, the, the patterns there, how for some reason, at least in, in, in our family, messenger is exclusively in French and uh, Darija written with Romanized letters and, yes. and numbers usually happens on WhatsApp. So it was really, uh, really wonderful to see that. So thank, thank you, you so much and good to hear. And also to say again, there is not necessarily an objective logical reason for these fossilizations. It's how things, because there is a, the array of options, but it gets tiresome maybe after a while. So people People stick to a particular app and then do communication with particular people in uh, to that app. In some cases, we see a more strategic selection of apps. So one of these uh, younger informants told us that so she uses a, one particular app for certain people just to keep them separate from the mass, <laughs> and she uses another app for most of her contacts. So it's both ways. It's something like a fossilization sometimes, and it's something that uh, like a more strategic tailoring at other times. Mm -hmm. I'll put into the chat two links to your consideration, but I am, of course, very happy to take uh, more questions. Alice, is there anything else to read um, out? Well, um, if you don't mind, like um, um, I'm just going to wrap this sessions up because I yes, think we've only got a couple minutes for other people to go to different um, sessions. And we we'll really thank you so much. Um, that this is a really wonderful. And also, I, I really love that like, we suddenly beams into the 2020s um, century. It's not even 21st century. Just start thinking about the digital aspect of multilingualism. So, and it's removing us a little bit away from what's just what we can see around us there. So um, so on that note, I would like to thank um, Yanis again for coming um, to the conference very early in the morning in Hamburg. Um, big round of applause. And for everybody else, I would like to encourage you to stay on and because we still got four very exciting parallel sessions. Okay, so um, I'm just going to say goodbye and close the room here and please go to chat um, and to joined different sessions we'll be seeing you somewhere see you later see you thank you again thanks thanks thank you Anne.